Hi, this is Ray Mossholder with the breaking evening news for Monday, March 3rd, 2023. Former President Trump returned to New York today to face a historic booking and arraignment on hush money charges related to allegations of sexual encounters that occurred several years before he was president. The nation's largest city greatly strengthened security and warned pro-Trump protesters that this was, quote, not a playground for your misplaced anger. Trump's long day began with a motorcade ride from his Mar-a-Lago club to his red and white and blue Boeing 757, emblazoned with his name in gold letters. It was all carried live on television. The mini parade took him past supporters. Many who had begun their watch before dawn, waving banners and declaring Trump was facing a kangaroo court and a crooked state district attorney. The truth is, that's exactly what he is facing, a politically motivated trial full of a Manhattan jury that is absolutely ideologically opposed to him, and a braggadocious and atrocious Attorney General, Alvin Bragg, who is well known for bragging about his release of violent criminals once they're arrested and who campaigned before his election by telling the crowds that if he was elected, he would get Trump. Donald Trump is already into his third campaign to reclaim the White House that he lost to President Joe Biden in 2020. Yet in spite of the fact that the Democrats' side wants him to give up any thought of being reelected by causing him to drop out of the presidential race due to scandal, a race he's leading by 30 percent above the second place candidate. So far, President Trump sees this as an absolute boost to his campaign. Cable news networks followed his plane at airports in Florida and New York with video shots from the air. A small group of senior campaign aides were joined aboard the plane by his son, Eric Trump, who eagerly posted photos of the wall-to-wall -wall coverage from his seat. New York is where Donald Trump once built an empire and a great reputation with the building projects he completed, buildings like Trump Tower, and New York City's formerly woe-begone skating rink that he rescued for the people of the city, and much, much more. Democrats, as well as Republicans, deeply enjoyed him on his television program, The Apprentice. But when he turned to politics as a Republican candidate, his reputation took a beating that is still continuing. From Spygate, where it was constantly spied upon by Hillary and her entourage, to terribly expensive impeachment trials led by Nancy Pelosi in the then Democrat-controlled House of Representatives, to the Mueller report with a phony dossier paid for by Hillary Clinton to this Manhattan court of his opponents, Donald Trump 
has been given raw deals. When Trump stepped out of his jet alone and got directly into a waiting black SUV, no one greeted him and things became very different than they had been in Florida. Only small groups of people lined the route as his motorcade with a police escort whisked him into Manhattan. Advisors said Trump spent the flight working. After arriving in Manhattan, he met with his attorneys and he'll spend the night at Trump Tower before surrendering to authorities at the courthouse tomorrow. Security in and around Trump Tower is tight. He's scheduled to arrive at the courthouse at 2 p.m., but for whatever reason, it would appear that he will actually go to the courthouse to be fingerprinted and have a mugshot taken earlier. Court is scheduled to begin at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Trump senior advisor Jason Miller said money is pouring in from all over the nation to help Trump get reelected. His campaign has now raised seven million dollars since the word of the indictment broke out. Tomorrow we'll most likely find two women saying they had sexual encounters with the married Trump several years before he got into politics. Trump denies these affairs. When President Joe Biden was asked if anything could go wrong with the trial proceedings, he answered, nope, I have faith in the New York Police Department and our nation's legal system. Boca Raton firefighter Eric Sullenston and his retired colleague John Fisher put up banners that were evident as he left Mar-a-Lago. One was 30 by 6 feet, 9 by 2 meters, picturing police officers and firefighters saying thanks for having our backs, President Trump. We are fire rescue. We are prepared and don't like to wait for things to happen. He told news reporters, Trump needs a morale boost, just like everyone else does when things are going crazy. He's done more for this country than any 10 presidents combined. Tomorrow, Trump's first trial begins. Although the exact charges haven't yet been released, it's known that Donald Trump will face one felony count. The following is from The Federalist, written by Joy Pullman. Bill and Hillary Clinton's long, crooked political careers have been marked by multiple well-established high crimes and misdemeanors. Not the least of these was Hillary's decision to commit what amounts to multiple felonies by using an insecure private email system to conduct top-secret public business while she was the United States Secretary of State under Barack Obama. After she found herself in trouble, she tried desperately to destroy her computer. This criminal behavior that so-called United States justice systems openly and repeatedly refused to punish was undertaken to hide treasonous actions. Those include selling political access 
and favors to foreign adversaries, as journalist Peter Schweitzer and others, including the Federalist and members of Congress, have repeatedly and thoroughly documented. Selling political favors to foreign opponents, including Communist China and authoritarian Russia, is clearly treason. Treason is defined as, quote, the betrayal of allegiance toward one's own country, especially by committing hostile acts against it or aiding his enemies in committing such acts. The Clintons got filthy rich from doing just that. Clinton then compounded that with more treasonous conduct when she lost the election in 2016 to Donald Trump. It is by now well established that Hillary Clinton's campaign paid various actors to lie to the United States intelligence agencies about Trump in an operation that eventually essentially negated the 2016 election, including encouraging federal employees treasonous behavior and two falsely predicted impeachments and help lose Republicans the 2020 election. Her campaign even tacitly confirmed this by paying a slap on the wrist Federal Election Commission fine while still refusing to admit guilt for it a few weeks ago, seven years after the fact. Hillary paid to have Trump falsely smeared as a traitor, laundering the slander through United States agencies that are supposed to provide equal justice under the law, but now function as weapons to damage Democrats' political opposition. In conjunction with the others in the Obama administration that likely include Obama himself, she colluded with multiple security agencies to slander, undermine, hamper, and now threaten with jail time the Democrats' top political opponent. Now that is treason. It's ongoing, and these traitors are all running about totally scot-free while they jail their political opponents for what at best are misdemeanors, and for which they refuse to prosecute anyone on the left who perpetrates them from the street rioters smashing windows, setting fire to police cars and police stations, murder, robbery, Hunter Biden, etc. My colleague L.A. Purnell pointed out that when Trump countenanced chance of locker up at his rallies over Clinton's never penalized repeat criminal behavior, Democrats lost their minds and insisted this was the stuff of dictatorships, tyranny, and political repression. Spygate intelligence official Michael McFall said, quote, dictatorships lock up the opposition, not democracies. Top Spygate propagandist Julia Ioff asked, since when do Americans advocate jailing political opponents? 
Barack Obama said in 2016, quote, in a democracy, you can't threaten to jail your opponents. We fought against those kinds of things. The Democrat National Committee Twitter account tweeted, in America, we don't send our political opponents to jail. The Clintons are clearly traitors, willing to endanger their nation for profit, and it would be fully just to prosecute them as such. Yet as president, when he had the chance, Trump decided not to pursue it. According to Trump Attorney General Bill Barr's recently published book, his memoirs, quote, Trump brought up the investigation into Hillary Clinton's emails and surprised Barr by saying that he wanted the matter to be dropped after the 2016 election. Trump told Barr, even if she were guilty for the election winner to seek prosecution of the loser would make the country look like a banana republic. Even uh, ever since riding down his golden escalator, Trump has been ceaselessly vilified as a tin pot dictator, an evil super villain, an authoritarian, the second coming of Adolf Hitler. But Democrats can change the facts, which include that Trump had fully legitimate justification to prosecute his horribly corrupt political opponent, and he refused to do it. They could make no such argument for themselves. So if it is indeed the stuff of banana republics and ending democracies to jail one's political opponent, let's all be clear about which political party is dragging the nation down that route. And let all in authority who care about equal justice under the law begin viciously applying Democrat standards to them until they stop perverting justice to destroy our country. Residents across a wide swath of the United States raced frantically Sunday and today to assess the destruction from the fierce storms that spawned dozens of tornadoes from the south and midwest into the northeast. The number of deaths continued to grow Sunday. It's now known that the violent storms killed at least 32 people. One of the dead was found inside his heavily damaged home near Bridgeville, Delaware. The United States Space Agency, NASA, has named four astronauts who will take humanity back to the moon after a 50-year gap. 44-year-old Christina Koch will become the first woman astronaut ever assigned to a lunar mission. 46-year-old Victor Glover will be the first black astronaut to circle the moon. 47-year-old Reed Wiseman is a United States Navy pilot who served for a time as the head of NASA's astronaut office. He flew one previous mission to the International Space Station in 2015. And 47-year-old Jeremy Hansen, who before joining 
the Canadian Space Agency, was a fighter pilot with the Royal Canadian Air Force. This will be his first time in space. Reed Wiseman will be the commander, Glover will be his pilot, and Coke and Hansen will act as the supporting mission specialists. The quartet will duplicate the first human spaceflight mission in December 1972. The difference will be in the advanced technology that has taken place since that time. NASA still doesn't have the technology that would bring a space flight to the moon. And here's more news in brief. Reports have emerged that the Chinese spy balloon that was shot down after it had surveyed military bases in the United States was able to transmit data back to Beijing in real time in spite of the United States government effort to prevent it from doing that. It's now known that the school shooter in Nashville had planned her attack for months. Grammy winners Tanya Tucker and Patti Loveless will be inducted into the 2023 Country Hall of Fame. So will country songwriter Bob McDill. The three will be formally inducted during a ceremony this fall. Tucker has had 10 number one hits and more than 40 songs in the top 10. The popular daytime series General Hospital will mark its 60th, I said 60th, anniversary this week, making it the longest running scripted show currently in production on American television. The soap is making the milestone with a fan favorite storyline called the Nurses Ball. It's a gala that will raise money for charity. Two workers died at the John F. Kennedy International Airport in New York City today after they became trapped in a trench. Oslo police in Norway have seized about 1,808 pounds, 820 kilograms of cocaine. That's the country's biggest bust of the drug ever. And finally, move over guys! The women's final four played in a much smaller venue but had more recognizable names. An all-session ticket for the women's final four was at least $475 on StubHub and $335 on Vivid Seats. Men's all-sessions ses tickets were going for $65. Sorry, guys, you just had to wait. Your turn, ladies first. More breaking news tomorrow. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go to bed now so that I'll be able to bring you tomorrow's news. And it should be a lollapalooza. <laughs>